Now we begin our last unit of study in this course, dealing with three special kinds of functions. We're going to deal with parametric, polar, and vectors. We're going to spend a day reviewing the material from pre-cal and then a day doing the calculus, sometimes two days, doing the calculus associated with it. So we're going to go back and do a little bit of review of what are called parametric equations. Does anybody know what the word parameter means? Like how big something is? It's a restriction of some kind. Yeah, it's some sort of, you know, it has to fall within these guidelines, these parameters. Parameter is kind of a guideline kind of a word. But in mathematics, what it is, is a third variable introduced into a problem dealing with x and y. If you start reading at the top of the page, it says, until now, we've been representing graphs by single equations involving variable x and y. You know, x and y, put in the equation, calculator, and off you go. We've also looked at straight line motion. Do you remember the moving man that we did once before where the guy walked across the number line and we went and we talked about its velocity, its acceleration, its speeding up, slowing down, things like that. Okay, where his distance along the line, we had x and time. But now we're going to put the three together. We're going to have x, y, and time all in the same problems. We're going to, um, and these are called parametric equations. So let's look at this example. It says, suppose you're a golfer strikes a golf ball that is propelled into the air at an angle of 45 degrees. If the initial velocity of the ball is 64 feet per second, it can be shown that the ball follows this path, where the x-axis is how far away from him the ball is, the y is how high it is. Okay, so basically we're modeling the path of the ball. If we introduce time, but the thing is though with this graph, we don't know where it is at one second. Where is it at two seconds? That's the thing we don't know. We just know that it goes on this path. But we don't know where it is at specific points in time. But if we introduce this third variable called a parameter and change the equations, we get an equation with x and t, and then we get an equation with y and t. So what it does is it allows you to define specific points on a graph based on when you get there, OK? And because now we're not restricted to going from left to right, because time is the one that changes everything, we can graph things backwards. And we're going to see the calculator actually graph things in a reverse order and in a reverse direction today. OK? So if you look in the box, here's the most important part you need to be aware of. If we have two functions, f and g, that are continuous, they're functions of t on the interval from t1 to t2, then the equations x is a function of time and y is a different function of time are called parametric equations and t is called the parameter. The set of points that you obtain as you plug in the different values of t is the graph. And the parametric equations and their graph together is called a plane curve. Now, I wish I had the time to do this, but there is an activity that I've done in the past called ships in the fog. And there's a true story. Several over a hundred years ago about these two steamships that were traveling in foggy conditions and they're they're both going in straight lines and their paths are going to cross but because they're going at different speeds are they going to hit each other if this ship comes here and then this one comes later they won't hit even though the graphs look like they cross each other so what it does is it allows you to graph the motion in terms of time and you can actually see the two ships head towards each other and barely miss each other because of the way that the parameter of t is figured into the problem. So I know this is all kind of fuzzy. It'll make a lot more sense once we start doing some problems with it. We're going to do some by hand, and we're going to do some with the calculator. Okay? When you sketch a curve by hand with parametric equations, you use increasing values of t. t gets bigger. Thus, the curve will have to go in a specific direction. This is called the orientation of the curve, and you use arrows to show the orientation. So I will show you how this works as we do a, a sample problem at the bottom. Now, t is not always time. This, this was a question brought up last time. We're going, for example, from t is negative 2 to 3. t a lot of times represents time, but it can be anything you want it to be. It's just a third variable involved in the problem. So let's take a look at this first example. We're going to complete the table and then graph the curve. So let's just take the x row. We're going to look at this equation, which is in terms of x and t. I want you to plug in the values of t and tell me what the x values would be. But first, 
please correct that. That second number is supposed to be negative 1, not positive 1. They forgot the negative sign. If I plug negative 2 in for t, what is x? 3. Three. Negative 1 gives me what? 0. 0 gives me? 1 gives me? 0. 2 gives me? 3. And 3 gives me? 8. Okay? That was pretty straightforward, right? Plug again. Now do the same thing for y. Jump up to the t values. Remember, we're not using x. We're using the t value. Negative 2 into the t here gives me what? Negative 3. 0 gives me? 0. Is that right? <coughs> Hang on. Are we right on this one? Negative 6 divided by 2. We're not, we're ignoring the x row. Plug negative 2 into here. Negative 6 divided by 2 is negative 3. Plug negative 1. Oh, I jumped the gun. That's what I did wrong. So this should be negative 3 halves. Okay. Next one, 0. You had it right and I did not. 0 for the next one is 0. Yes. I was looking at the wrong row. This one is positive 3 halves. What's the next one? Three. three. And the next one would be nine, nine halves. Okay? Are we good? Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, when you graph parametric equations, you don't graph the t. You, you put the dots where it goes, but you don't graph the t's, except for the first and last point. They, they are not part of where you grid. Here's what I, let me show you what I mean. So we're going to plot the point three, negative three first. So three, negative three is right there. The next point is 0, negative 3 halves, which is right there. So do you notice I'm going to the left, which is kind of strange. The next point is negative 1, 0, which is right there. The next point is 0, 3 halves, which is up here. So I'm turning around. Then 3, 3, which is there. And 8, 9 halves, which is 4.5, is up here. So this makes, what kind of shape is this? Parabola. It's a parabola on its side. Now it's a closed interval, so we're going to stop at the two endpoints. That's the graph. Okay? But because it is parametric, the order that we put the dots on the page matters. So. I want to do this. I want to label that this is where we started. This is where we stopped. t equals negative 2 and t equals 3. And I'm going to put an arrow in the section, like every other section, showing that's the direction that I plotted the points. That's the way we draw parametric equations. Let me stop and talk for a minute about how t steps work. Now notice that our t's went by 1's. Okay, if I only graphed every two, if I didn't graph the negative one and I didn't graph the positive one, I graphed this point, this point, and this point, would you know that it curved like that? If I only had this dot, this dot, and this dot, it would look like a V, wouldn't it? Okay, the closer your steps are together, the more curved, if it is a curve, your graph will become. And we will play with that a little bit on the calculator to show that the closer you put your steps together, the better the graph tends to look. But too close together, it makes your graph stop in the water. And we'll show you how to fix that as well. Okay? Does everybody understand the steps we went through? Yeah. Question. So you just write like your, your first T and your last T? Mm -hmm. Those are the only two you need to write. And the arrows show you that the rest of them are in between show, and show you in which direction they fall. How do you know which direction they fall? By the... Okay, the, the order in which I plotted them on the paper, and that's the way I drew my arrows. Okay? Any other questions? Okay, I want you to do number two. Same process. It's the same graph, but the equations are different, aren't they? But what else is different beside the equation? The, what they call the t-step. It's the distance between, it's the delta t, the change in t, is now different as well. So if you change them in the same manner, 
you end up getting the same graph. How much has the change in t been cut by? It's been cut in half, hasn't it? Instead of going by ones, we're going by halves. But in the equation, we have actually doubled the t's. Okay, Both of those equations over there. If you took the ones on the left and you substituted in 2t instead of t, you would get 4t squared minus 1 for x, and you would get 6t over 2, which is 3t for, for y. So cutting the step in half and doubling the t in the equation gives us the same graph. It's just the way that it looks. Okay? Turn to the back, please. Now we're going to do some algebra. And some of this is going to come back from pre -cal. Some of you it's going to be a reteach, and that's okay. You're going to do a lot of trig in this unit, I'm telling you right now. Here's where the trig comes in. Okay? Many times, if we wanted to just graph, we want to know just what the graph looks like. Instead of drawing out the chart and plotting the points, we can sometimes do what's called eliminate the parameter. And eliminate the parameter basically means get rid of the t or the theta. t and theta are the common, most common parameters that we use. Okay? So basically what that means is take one equation, solve it for t, plug it in the other one, get rid of the t's. Okay? So this is just algebraic manipulation of our two parametric equations. Now, rectangular equations is what equations are called when they're just x and y. So what we've been doing all along are rectangular equations because they go on a rectangular grid. These are parametric equations because they have the t's in them. Okay? So, which one of those two equations would it be easier to solve for t? The x or the y? The y. So let's take the y and solve it for t. What would t equal in that case? y over 2, okay? So we take one equation, we solve it for t, then we go plug it into the other equation. So take the x equation now and plug in y over 2 where the t was, oops, squared, plus 3. And then plug it into the other equation. Yes, in place of the t, yes. Now I have an equation with x's and y's, which is what I want. The only thing is I need to solve it for y. So how do I get y by itself? Square root. Square Not root. yet. Square root. Square root. Subtract minus three. three first. So x minus three equals y over two squared. Now what? Square root. Square root both sides. y over two equals plus or minus the square root of x minus three. And now multiply by two. Now be careful, when you multiply by 2, it has to go between the plus or minus and the square root sign. So plus or minus 2 square roots of x minus 3 equals y. Okay. Now, we need to go back and look because as you noticed on the parabola, we didn't graph the whole parabola, did we? We just graphed part of it. That was because of the limitations based on t. So what I want you to do is go up to the top of this page and look at x and y. Look specifically at x first. Now all of your answers for x will be looking how? What's the smallest x can be? Think about it. The answer is 3. How did I get that? Well, try 0. If I plug in 0 for t, I'm going to get 3 for x, right? If I plug in anything bigger than 0, like 1, this will be 4. 2, this will be 7. 3, this will be 9 or 12. So bigger numbers go bigger because of the square. But what if I put negatives in here? They would turn positive and go bigger too. So 0 is the smallest this can go. 0 is the smallest t can go, which means that 3 is the smallest x can go. Does that make sense to you? Okay, let me say it one more time. Because of the square, anytime you have squares that you have to look at, or possibly other things, if you have a square, you need to look and see, is there any restriction on x? And in this case, the smallest this can go 
is the smallest t can go, I mean, excuse me, the smallest x can go is 3. Because if you plug in 0 for t, that's the smallest thing that will, that will generate the smallest answer for x. Okay? So we have to add on here, x has to be greater than or equal to 3. And that's how that graph's going to look. x is greater than or equal to 3. Usually you put the restriction on x and then y's restrictions come out of that. All right, let's look at number 4. Same kind of process. We want to get one letter by itself, get one, take one of the equations and get the t by itself and then plug it in the other one. Now this time they're both about equally as ugly. So it's usually better if you can to get x's t by itself and then plug it in. Then you usually have less math to clean it up with. So let's take this side and solve for t. What should I do first? Multiply by the denominator. Does that sound good? So I have, let's move this over here, x square root t plus 4 equals 1. Okay, now what? Divide by x, because I'm trying to get the t by itself. So the square root of t plus 4 equals 1 over x. And then square both sides. So t plus 4 equals 1 squared is just 1 over x squared. Let's just put the x squared on the bottom. What's the last step? Subtract 4. Subtract 4. So t equals 1 over x squared minus 4. Are you with me? Okay. So now we're going to plug that into the y equation. The t goes where both of the t's are. So y equals 1 over x squared minus 4 on top. 1 over x squared minus 4 plus 4 on the bottom. What's going to happen on the bottom? It's just going to be 1 over x squared. The 4's are going to cancel. Agreed? Yeah. Okay. Now, how do I get rid of the fractions inside of the fractions? Oh, We're going to multiply the top and the bottom by the denominator, which is x squared. So I'm going to use another color for this just to make it stand out. So we're going to multiply this by x squared and that by x squared. And now we have y equals x squared over x squared is 1 minus 4x squared. And what's going to happen to the denominator? It's just going to be 1. Agreed? So then I am finished with that one. However, we need to look again and see if there's any restriction on x. How did I do this step here? Okay, that's what we're going to talk about. Okay. Now, it tells me already the t has to be greater than negative 4. Well, why is that? Look at this. If I go less than negative 4, that'll be undefined. It'll be a negative and a radical, or be an, a complex number, okay? So, it can't be negative 4, because that would make a 0 on the bottom. If it was negative 3, what would this whole fraction be? It'd be 1. If it was up to 0, what would this whole fraction be? one half. The bottom would be 2, but the whole fraction would be 1 half. Is there any way that this fraction could be negative? Think about it. No. no, because 1 is positive and the square root of anything is always positive also. So that means that this fraction x has to be greater than 0. It can't equal 0 though, because there's no way I can say 1 divided by something equals 0. That's impossible. So my restriction is that x is greater than 0. Now I know this is, the restrictions are hard. We don't have to do them very often. But it is something to think about because if I was to graph this, that would just be a parabola. Just a regular parabola. But if I did it with the parametric graphs, I'd only get the right side. And so this is showing me that this is, I have to draw, draw only the right side to make it match this one. Okay, now we get into the trig. Any questions on four before I move on? Yes. I just understand the x part, so even number three, 
the ex Okay. So let me see if I can go back and explain number three one more time. Okay. Do you understand, understand that that right there will always be positive? No matter what I plug in for T, that, that term right there will always be positive. Agreed? So if I add 3 to it, it's still going to be positive. Does that make sense? There's no way it could be negative. And so... Oh, because even if it's T equals 1... Right, it would be 4. Or T equals 0. It'd be 3. So if this is always positive, it could be 0, but it's always positive. So the smallest it can be is 0. The smallest this whole thing can be is 3, and that's why I get greater than or equal to 3. Okay? Here... The smallest this can be is greater than zero. It can't equal zero on the bottom because that's, that's a no-no. No bottom of the fraction can be zero. But it can be greater than zero, right? It can be positive. The top is always positive. Therefore, the whole fraction has to be positive. That's greater than zero. Oh, and the bottom can be negative because you can have a negative square. Yes, exactly. Okay, only question. I was just wondering, what would happen if the C was like an imaginary? T, if, if T was I, um, that would get into some mathematics that is way beyond what we're going to do in this class. But it is possible. It is possible. It's more of a college level math than this. Okay? Now, look at number five. X equals five sine theta, Y equals four cosine theta. Hmm. Like I said, those are about as equally difficult. So let's take the X one and solve it for theta, because theta is the parameter here. Well, how do you know what the parameter is? It's the variable that's in both equations. Okay. How do I get theta by itself? First step? Hmm? Divide by 5 first. I have to do that. X over 5 equals sine of theta. So theta equals, how do you move the sine over? Arc sine, sine inverse. I like to write sine inverse because it takes less paper. So theta equals sine inverse of x over 5. So what we're going to do is we're going to plug that into the y equation. And we're going to have y equals 4 cosine sine inverse of x over 5. Okay. I know you did this last year. Mm -hmm. You may not remember how, but you did it. Okay. So what we're going to do to simplify this is we need to draw a triangle, and I'm going to do it over here. Make it a first quadrant triangle. Theta always goes at zero. Now the theta is the same for both equations. All right? Now you can go back to here. Sine of theta equals x over five. Using SOHCAHTOA, where does the x go and where does the, si the five go on my triangle? X is the vertical. X is the vertical, that's the opposite is the hypotenuse. So it's opposite over hypotenuse. Do you all agree with that? you all remember that? Okay. Can you find the third side? Yes. Yes. Pythagorean theorem. So it would be a squared plus x squared equals 5 squared. Agreed. So a squared equals 25 minus x squared. So this will be the square root of 25 minus x squared. We only use the positive. We don't do plus or minus because we're talking about the length of a side of a triangle. Can't be negative. So remember that the original equation said 4 cosine of theta. We wrote it this way, but can you look at that triangle and tell me what the cosine of theta is? Yeah. Yes. So that would be 4 times what over what? The adjacent over the hypotenuse, which is the square root of 25 minus x squared over 5. And you can write that just with the 4 on top. And that's the equation. Which function is that? Cosine, adjacent over hypotenuse, Sokotoa. Okay. Can you explain what you mean? All right. From the white. Did you understand where the sides of the triangle yeah. came from? Okay. Now, I went back up here. Y, the equation Y is 4 times the cosine of theta. So I go to the triangle. Cosine is adjacent over hypotenuse. So that's the square root side over the 5. So that went here, and then the 4 out front. 
and then I cleaned it up. Yes? So I, was, I actually didn't understand where the size came from, why the five was uh, hypotenuse. Sokotoa. Remember Sokotoa sine is opposite over hypotenuse, cosine is adjacent over hypotenuse? Because it said sine of theta is x over five, that's the opposite, that's the hypotenuse. Because it's sine. So you said five is the opposite? No, x is the opposite, opposite the theta, five is the hypotenuse. Okay, and that doesn't change if it's sine inverse? It doesn't prove it? No, what the sine inverse says, the angle is the one that has a sine of x over five. Okay, it is the same thing. Mm -hmm. Any more questions? Yes, sir. The whole point of these three problems was to find an equation with only x and y. Yes, eliminating the parameter was the point of this. Now, can theta, can the angle theta be any size we want? Can angles be any size we want? They can be negative, positive, zero, doesn't matter, <laughs> right? So there is no restriction on this. There is no restriction on this equation because theta can be anything. Now, we're going to do the easiest problem of the day, okay? Now we're going to go the other way. Instead of me giving you the parametric and you go to the rectangular, I'm going to give you the rectangular and you're going to give me the parametric. And you will not believe how easy this is, okay? So let me scoot this up. Scratch out part B because we're not going to do that where it says m equals dy dx. Okay, the reading right above the problem tells us what to do. We can represent a rectangular equation with parametrics in an infinite number of ways. We discovered on the front that we had two different equations and the same graph. Okay, the easiest way is to let t equal x and then substitute in what y is. This is so easy, folks. So here is my equation y equals x minus x squared. It says let x equal t and then let y be what it is in terms of t. What would y be? t minus t squared. T minus t squared. I'm done. Wait. Yes? So for number 5, uh -huh. the cosine of sine, would you do the same thing? There's no t. So. They used, okay, the parameter on that one was theta instead of t. Okay. We could have written those two as x equals sine of t, 5 sine of t, and y equals 4 cosine of t. But they wrote it in terms of theta to make it easier to know you needed to draw a triangle. Okay? okay? All right. Are we good with that? Now it's time to pull out the calculator. So grab your calculator real quick. Okay. I'm about to teach you a new feature of your calculator. Every graph we've ever drawn on this thing has been x's and y's, and now it's time to draw in parametric mode. So I want you to push the mode key. Do you know where the mode key is? It is right here, next to the blue one. Okay, everybody push mode. You need to stay with me. Please go down to the fourth line where it says PAR. That's parametric mode. Please push enter after you've highlighted PAR. And then I want you to push y equals and see what's changed. Looky there. Okay, those are parametric equations. Now push the x key right now. What does it actually print for you? A t, because it knows it's supposed to be t's now. So here's what I want you to do. Let's play with this for a minute. I want you to type those two equations we just wrote down into y equals. So you've got a t for the x. Push enter. Now go t minus t squared. t minus t squared. It defaults to what you need. If it's in parametric, it puts t's. If it's in regular, it puts x's. On Friday, we're going to learn that if you're in polars, it puts theta. Okay? Now, do not push graph yet. I want you to push the window key, please. Now, the window, because t guides everything, the window starts out by talking about what's called a t-min, a t-max, and a t-step. The t-step is how far apart it's going to plot the points. Okay? Do you recognize the t-max number? It's a pi times 2. It's pi times 2. It is 2 pi. So usually we like to do our t's in terms of 2 pi because that's once around the circle. All right? And it's a good t-step to have. Now, I'll tell you right now that t-step, you don't recognize it. It's pi over 12. And pi over 12 tends to be close enough together that it will graph, 
but it won't draw jaggedy lines. We'll do one with jaggedy lines in a minute, okay? Notice that my window is negative 10 to 10 and negative 10 to 10. Is anybody else's different from that? Yes. Okay, if yours is different, actually we'll all fix it together, okay? If yours is on negative 10 to 10, you could just push the graph key and you'd be good to go. If you're not, push the zoom 6 key, please. Push zoom right now and number 6. And look what it did. It just drew to the right. Now, look at the original rectangular equation, x minus x squared. What kind of graph is that? What kind of graph is this? Not, it's a parabola because it's x squared. And it's upside down because it's negative. Okay? But did it draw the whole parabola? No, why not? Because I started at t equals 0. So if I plug 0 into both of these, what am I going to get? 0 and 0. And then it moved forward from that point. Okay? So here is that graph. Now, how can we make it graph the whole thing? Go back to the window and change the t min to negative 6. The first one's positive 6. Negative 6 is good enough. It'll get the whole thing in there. Now push graph again. Do you get the whole thing? There, it drew the whole thing. Up and over. Let's draw this thing right here. Look at this. Look at the loop-de-loop. -loop. We're going to make it do the loop-de-loop, -loop, OK? So the equation for the loop-de-loop -loop is over here. Look on your paper, or you can look at the screen, either one. We're going to draw the, we're going to put this into y equals. So go to y equals and type in these two equations. OK? t minus 2 sine t close. Everybody needs to do this with me, please. And then we're going to do 2 minus 2 cosine of t. Okay? Just put those in. Do not go any farther. Now, we have to set three things. We have to set t, we have to set x, and we have to set y. Okay? t, they told us right here. They want it to go from 0 to 10. So push the window key, please. When you push window, we're going to go from 0 to 10 and leave the step alone for now. Okay? Now, as far as the x's and y's, look at the graph itself. What do the x's go? What does the x-axis go from? What does it look like? 0 to 11. So let's do that. x min is 0. x max is 11. With a scale of 1 is good. What about the y's? 0, beyond 4, let's go up to 5. So let's do y min is 0, y max is 5, with a scale of 1. Okay? Now push graph as soon as you're done. Don't push the zoom key after you, do, after you set it. Is it a roller? It's a loop-de-loop. -loop. Yeah. It's kind of cool, huh? You see how it does all these loop-de-loops and curly cues and stuff like that? Yes. I need to show you, though, how to fix it if it gets stuck. And everybody needs to listen and follow along. Let's look at this, okay? Let's actually do, yeah, let's do this one. Um, go back to window. I want you to change your t-step to 1 and see what it does to the graph, okay? That's just, like, wrong, isn't it? Okay, because it's only plotting at the ends of the straight lines. That's just yuck, okay? So, sometimes you're going to have to play with the T and figure out which one works best. One is not going to work in this case, okay? So let me show you what happens if you pick one that goes too slow. That one went too fast. We need one that goes slower, okay? So what we're going to do, go back to window. I'm going to purposely break your calculator for a minute, so listen carefully. I'm going to show you how to fix it. Okay. I want you to change this to 0 0.01 for the T-step. Yes, I'm going to show you how to fix it. Okay. Now, push graph. Okay. And it's sitting there. And it's sitting there. And it's like, well, is it stuck or is it not? Now, listen carefully. At 0 0.01 or 0 0.1? You probably did point one. Point zero one? 
Are you yeah, sure it's, it's point zero one? It's really slow. Okay. Now, if I'd gone point zero zero one, it would have been even slower. Okay. I know it's working because this thing is scrolling at the top. Do you see the scroll? Look on your own calculator. Do you see a scroll in the top corner? Okay. I want you to push enter right now, and look how it changes up there in the corner. That is the uh, spazzing out kind of a look. That's that is paused. That is what it looks like when it's paused. Okay. If you want it to stop because it's stuck in this laborious, oh my gosh, it won't go any faster, push the on key. And notice when you push the on key, the thing at top goes completely away. And now the calculator is done graphing where you are. So on will fix everything. Anytime you accidentally set your T wrong, push the on key to make it stop. Not pause, on, okay? So let's go back. If you do point one, point one's a good one. Point one's what we did basically at the beginning. Push graph again. There we go. So now we have our nice little loop-de-loop. -loop. Okay? Now, let's try to do the star. See the star at the bottom left? The equations are in the box to the side. This is called a hypocycloid. Hypocycloid. Now, we have to set the window the way it's written here or we're not going to see the whole thing. We're, we're only in quadrant one right now. So we've got to go back to y equals, or to, yeah, y equals. I'm just going to call it y equals. It's either that way. Now remember, with parametrics, you need to go to the window first. The, for the first time around, you need to go to window. All right. What does it tell me about t? t has to go from what to what? Zero to 20. Step of point one is usually a good step every time. Okay? Now, what does our window go from? I would say negative 5 to 5. Go beyond what it says right there. So let's do x min. Make sure you're on the x min to start. Negative 5 to 5. And the same thing is true with the y's. Negative 5 to 5. y min is negative 5. y max is positive 5. As soon as you've got it all set, then push graph. The t-step is point 0.1 is good. Point 0.1 is usually a good t-step. Isn't that cool? That is very, very cool. It does it if it's one, but because it's straight lines, it doesn't affect the way the graph is. If it's curved, it's going to cause a problem because it just looks like it looks really jagged. What's that? What's that video game that's all jaggedy and old looking? Minecraft. That's the one I'm thinking of. It kind of looks Minecrafty if you if you put the t-step as one. Okay. Because the when you plug in t equals twelve, it the second point is off your screen. It's beyond what your screen has been graphed. Okay. So what have we done today? We've learned what parametrics are. We know what x and y are in terms of t. We know how to hand plug them in, hand graph them, and how to put it in the calculator. Okay. So your assignment is going to be practicing on these kinds of things. Graphing weird stuff. Any questions?